Nowhere Man takes up where the last day started. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. I had done a video about John Lennon and his assistant Fred Seaman. Seaman had taken the diaries of John Lennon after his death. He claimed John Lennon told him if something should happen to him to give the diaries to Julian. So there seems to be some doubts if that was true because he took the diaries to a friend of his and I found out the friend's name was Robert Rawson. So Rosin tells a different story. He said the diaries written by John Lennon is about the last six years of his life. And Rosin said that Seaman gave him the diaries and told him that John Lennon wanted him to write a book and he should do that after he died. So Rosin felt that the diaries were the start of a memoir that John may have been thinking about writing. Rosin felt that if he didn't write the book, the story would never have been told in his lifetime. So Rosin made the decision to put the story out there. So let us find out the insights through another set of eyes and see how he revealed the John Lennon he found by reading the diaries. Well, Seaman was a friend of Rosin's. Robert Rosin said that he met Fred Seaman when they were both in college. On December the 13th, 1980, five days after John Lennon died, Seaman was upset, tears streaming down his face. Fred said that John wanted a book written about him, and it wouldn't be a book about a happy, eccentric house husband raising John and baking bread while Yoko ran the family business. It would be a book about a tortured rock star, a prisoner of his fame. So Rosin believed Fred, and Seaman started working for the Lennons on February 1979. After one day on the job, Fred told Robert they needed to work on a book together. And Robert said yes and started taking notes in a diary. And for two years, Seaman would meet up with Rosin and tell him what was going on with the Lennons. When John died, Seaman stayed on working as an executive assistant. He had the run of the Dakota, and Fred gave Rosin raw material. He provided unreleased audio tapes, videotapes Lennon had recorded, photographs and slides that Seaman had taken over the two years, and notes that Lennon had written describing Seaman's uh, daily errands and chores. Rosin began transcribing the diaries. This wasn't an easy feat. It was a rigid routine that needed to be set up because there was a lot of work to transcribe. So Rosin came up with the idea of getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. He would get out of bed and get into the journals, and he'd work for 16 hours. Rosin was in awe of Lennon and how he managed to write down every detail, every dream, every conversation, every food he put in his mouth. Rosin said the work was slow and painful because he had to decipher each word and each letter. Rosin said that he was living like a monk for six months. He began to eat the foods that John ate, and he tried to get his weight down to John's weight. So Rosin found out that Seaman got fired. So Fred went to, to Rosin and said that the project could still go on. Seaman told him that he had someone to finance the book, and he told Rosin that he could take a vacation, which would be paid for. So this is the story that Fred told in his book, and this part must be true. So when Rosin got back to his apartment, it had been ransacked. All the things he worked on and all the stuff that Fred had given him were taken. Seaman had the keys to his place, and Rosin realized who had done it. So he reported it to the police. The detective said that nothing could be done. They couldn't prove a crime had been committed. Rosin didn't give up. He decided to take the notes of everything he remembered from the diaries, so he felt like he was doing a rock and roll Watergate book. When Rosin took his manuscript to an editor and publisher of Rolling Stone, his name was Janner, uh, he believed what Rosin said, and then he spoke to Yoko about it. So then he told Rosin that he needed to speak to Yoko, and Rosin was afraid of what was going to happen to him, but he did meet up with her. So Yoko, was she was really mad at Fred Seaman, and she told Rosin that John had wanted to fire Fred for using the Mercedes. He had been keeping track of the mileage. So Yoko told Rosin that they were both in it together, and Rosin agreed to cooperate in the investigation. So Yoko asked to read Rosin's diaries. He agreed, and Yoko, Sam, and Robert read them together. So Yoko and Sam paid Rosin $200 a week, plus an additional $300 on the first of each month. He was unable to get his diaries back for 18 years, and the book Nowhere Man was written from Rosin's memories. So now I'll give some highlights of the book to show the real John and how he lived during those final days of his life. So the rich life, John was quoted as saying, If I hadn't made money honestly, I'd have been a criminal. I was just born to be rich. 
So this was quoted in the National Enquirer, and John read it. So he said he didn't remember saying it, and he hadn't spoken to a reporter in five years. But this intrigued John, and he clipped it and pasted it on the first page of his 1980 New Yorker magazine, Death's Diary. Rosin said that John believed in the existence of God, so he knew he couldn't kill himself, and he didn't want Sean to be an orphan. So, But there was a depression in the air at the apartment from John and from Yoko, too. John's journals were his life. They gave him something to do. They were his friend. Yoko's mom had come from Japan, and Yoko and John didn't want to deal with her. They got a servant to take her around, and she was having a great time. <laughs> John one day decided to call his Aunt Mimi, and he asked her to move to America and live at the Dakota. She told John she was happy where she was, and she didn't like America. But uh, John said, well, you don't know. You've never been there. <laughs> so, but after he hung up with her, he panicked, thinking, I wonder if she says yes. <laughs> So then John's routine. Sometimes John would get up at 4 a.m. He would sit up in bed and record the exact time. Then he would walk to the window seat and look over Central Park in Midtown Manhattan and wait for dawn, or he would go back to bed. Mainly, he'd wake up about 6 or 7 a.m., and then he'd figure out his state of mind, which could be of one of three categories, up, okay, or down. If he was feeling good, he would do a half hour of yoga. He started that in India. It cleared his mind and relaxed him. John thought that if he meditated long enough, he would merge with God and acquire psychic powers like clairvoyance and the ability to fly through the air. So Yoko wanted him to have those powers too and encouraged him to keep doing it. By 1980, his optimism, energy, and ambition were running low. He didn't do the yoga very frequently, and he was smoking too many cigarettes and too much Thai weed, and he was drinking too much coffee and eating too much food. So John was upset with himself for not keeping up with yoga, but he just went back to his vices. One thing that he kept up on, though, was his weight. He was 5 feet 8, and his weight ranged from 135 to 140 pounds. And when he got near 140, it made him nervous. He also, he liked to change his looks. He didn't want to be recognized. He would wear a variety of hats, sunglasses, and clothing. Being in Manhattan helped with his disguise. And sometimes he would have a beard, and after a while he would shave it. And then John would shower and choose a hairstyle. Next, he would pick out his clothes. If he was in the Dakota, not going anywhere, he'd put on jeans and a t-shirt or a polo shirt. And if he wanted to go out, he'd check with Mother. She would usually get up at 5 a.m., and she would stay in her office downstairs called Studio One. And most of the night, she would nap on the couch, and she would make calls to Europe and Japan are plotting her moves with her tarot card reader, Charlie Swan. So John is in his relationship with Sean. Sean didn't like to be alone, and he slept with John and Yoko till he was three years old. But Yoko and John knew that wasn't a good idea, so Sean finally began to sleep in his own room, sometimes with a governess. And Sean would always usually make, awake with a smile, and John would kiss him, and they would go to the kitchen for breakfast. John felt guilty for deserting Cynthia and Julian, but John hadn't really wanted Julian at the time. John's greatest fear was that he'd grow distant from Sean and lose him permanently, as he'd lost everybody he had loved. Sean was the only thing that meant more than money. And then John spoiled Sean rotten. When Sean gave orders, the servants jumped. He got what he wanted when he wanted it. And if he didn't, he screamed, and he didn't stop screaming until he got it. So Sean was just like John and had tantrums. Then a scary incident happened. John kept track of all the details in Sean's life, and he always feared that Sean would be kidnapped. There were numerous kidnapping threats, but most of them were harmless. But one morning in late 1977, John answered the phone. A man with a heavy Spanish accent said to John that unless he gave him $250,000 cash, he was going to kidnap Sean and kill John and Yoko. Well, John tried to ignore it, didn't even tell Yoko or the police. Then the guy they dubbed the Latin lunatic called again and sounded serious. This time, John called the FBI. Two agents arrived within the hour, and they said they would monitor the calls and stake out the building. And John, Yoko, and Sean weren't allowed outside. The lunatic kept calling, but would hang up before they could trace him. He kept the calls... Uh, John kept getting the calls once or twice a day for a week, and the FBI couldn't do anything. John was getting stir-crazy, and he wanted to go out Christmas shopping. 
Then on the ninth day, it stopped. They never heard from him again. It was months before John could settle down, and he would jump every time the phone rang. You can't blame John for feeling like that. So I'm going to stop the video at this point. I hadn't planned to do another story of John Lennon so soon, but I came across the book by Robert Rosen, and I wanted to hear his take on the events that happened with him and Fred Seaman. So I thought his book was as close to the truth as it could be since Yoko had read his diaries regarding the story he was working on. And she even said that she could help with parts he might not have understood. Yoko was more furious with Fred Seaman and wanted him to be held responsible for stealing that, the items from the Dakota. I think anyone would have felt the same way. It was a theft of property, property that, that was hers now that John had passed away. When Robert had told Yoko he had read John's diaries, she said that he shouldn't have done that. She said that John's diaries were so sacred that she didn't even want to read them. So it's always interesting to see a glimpse of the real person behind the song, and I've always loved reading biographies from an early age, and I would read about everyone from Hollywood stars to historical figures. It was always a great way to spend a little more time with a person you had liked from what they had achieved. So John was a complex person, which I think most of us already knew, and this book is verifying it. And I'll conclude the video on my next episode. I hope everyone enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be appreciated. It helps me know I'm on the right track. And I wish everybody a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.